Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch store on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. Well, since you've come to this video looking for a review, I assume that you've already watched Star Trek Picard Season 1, Episode 2, Maps and Legends. Nevertheless, just for safety's sake, I will issue myself a... Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers! Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a Fandai master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me, and that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst, I figure it out about a half an hour too early. This is neither a boast nor a brag. This is sadly where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years' worth of science fiction. You just can't see the new stuff for the whole century that came before, and you discover there's just not that much that's new in the world, and it often interferes with your ability to enjoy things. Now, be aware that uh, I don't walk through the plot in my reviews. If you've made it past the spoiler, you've either already seen it or you don't, and you don't need a recap, or you just don't care if, if you get spoiled without knowing the plot. I do, however, go into far more depth than other reviewers. I don't say just if I like the film or not. I go into the acting, the direction, the cinematography, and the mechanics of making a film. And I can do this because a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I was once an actor, so I can speak with some authority. Not as much authority as a modern working actor. I never want to give that impression, but with some authority. There's an old saying, those who can do and those who can't teach. And I guess doing reviews is kind of like teaching. One thing I do not do is outrage videos. I know for a fact that there are reviewers who are simply portraying outrage. They are actors for the views because outrage sells. But that's not me. If I say something about, if I think something is good, I'll say why in detail that I think it's good. If I think it's bad, I will say why in detail I think it's bad. I will not be outraged just for the views. I am the adult in the room. I usually try to start off by saying something good and bad about what we've watched and so our great moments. Picard's defect in his parietal lobe. This is a reference to the final episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, in which Dr. Crusher warned him that it might lead to Eremotic Syndrome. As we saw in that episode, it has the potential to cause Picard to become senile at best. However, this is also something of a cringe moment, since we know that Picard has been picked up for at least another season, we know that this is somehow going to not become a non-issue. I mean, you can't have a series whose main title character is a senile old man incapable of rational thought. <laughs> Good moments. Uh, Lara, Laris and Javon uh, clearly being former Tal Shiar operatives. This is a very nice callback to something we saw frequently in Star Trek The Next Generation. I am unclear about my reaction to another even more secretive organization that's supposedly been around for thousands of years. While it has been established that the Vulcan schism that caused what are now Romulans to leave Vulcan was about 3,000 years ago, their ongoing purpose of destroying synthetic life forms seems a little silly. 3,000 years is a hell of a long time to nurse that kind of a grudge. It's all a bit weird considering that they're reclaiming a Borg ship that was filled with dangerous half-synthetic life forms. You'd think that this shadowy group would just nuke the thing from orbit and turn it into particles rather than risk it being reactivated. Another good moment, this being a gigantic Romulan plot to halt the use of synthetic beings. Obviously, Lieutenant Rizzo and Commodore O are Romulan operatives, and they're employing a Romulan death squad here on Earth. Another fun moment, the use of the Vasquez rocks for the location of... Um, 
of, uh, uh, forgetting her name here, Rafi's home. It is a neat little callback. And it's weird because particularly considering that those parts of the Vasquez rocks were seen only once in Star Trek during Kirk's fight with the Gorn in Arena in 1966. The fact that they have become rather iconically linked to Star Trek based on one episode is kind of amazing. Another good moment, the inclusion of a trill as part of the reclamation project. A nice little callback. Another one, First Contact Day. You know, I never really thought about it, but First Contact with Vulcans, as seen in this movie Star Trek First Contact, would logically be a day natural for an Earth holiday, and it would also be the day that would be natural for the synthetics to attack, since Utopia Polynesia would be largely deserted. Now, I do have cringe moments. I have a number of them, and one of them I'm going to go along on quite a lot and risk, frankly, pissing off some of my viewers. Cringe moments. The technology that we see in this episode, in any of it, while the holographic interfaces are a nice extension of Star Trek The Next Generation, and it's particularly nice because it borrows heavily from Next Generation's computer interfaces, it's the one thing that is about to be completely wrong. There's only one commonality in all of science fiction. The technology it portrays is always wrong. We're about to see a fantastic restructuring of computer science from the ground up. And now I know this, I can say this as someone who spent 40 years in that field. And here's what we're about to see in the very near future. Our computer monitors, TVs, etc. will consist of contact lenses that display information only that an individual can see. I read an article, I've been predicting this for some time, but I read an article about it only about a week ago. With five, within five to ten years, monitors, televisions, they'll be a thing of the past. Offices are going to be filled with people manipulating windows, opening things up, throwing them over here, closing things down, pulling out a, type, a keyboard to type on that only they can see. Offices are going to look a hell of a lot more like just magicians fooling around in the air than today's office buildings. And then there's quantum entanglement, and that is about to change everything. Wires, Wi-Fi, 4G, 5G, they're all about to become completely things of the past. Quantum entanglement will carry information anywhere in the world near instantaneously. Bandwidth, the whole concept of it, is about to become a thing of the past. Then there's quantum computing, and that's about to give you a supercomputer that's going to fit on a ring on your finger. And these will be far more powerful computers than any computers currently seen in existence. Virtual reality is also going to be perfective, and that is that you will be able to be enter virtual worlds that are totally indistinguishable from real life. All of your senses, not just vision, but all of them, will be replicated in a virtual environment. Now combine this with quantum entanglement and individuals will have access to their own personal virtual worlds tailored to suit their own tastes. They will control everything about it, from the look and feel, to what happens inside of it, to the basic physics. And it's quite possible that when all of this happens, people will spend all of their time in a virtual environment. Even going to work will be made obsolete by companies simply sharing a virtual environment with their employees. I mean, why step out of your own perfect virtual world into the crappy real world? We're also going to see sapient artificial intelligence. That's going to be developed in very soon. One of my colleagues who works on this says that the AIs may decide to simply exterminate the human race. He might be right. I tend to vacillate. My opinion vacillates on that some. But in any case, the technology that we see in any modern science fiction, including Star Trek, is about to be completely surpassed so dramatically as to make Star Trek Picard look fake and phony looking. Fans who dislike Star Trek, the original series, for looking fake and phony looking, take note. <laughs> Either you, or at worst your children, are going to think the exact same thing about any modern incarnation of Star Trek. As with the original series, the only the stories are going to be left. You'd better hope that they're engaging, or you and your children are just going to laugh at all of this stuff, just as modern fans laugh at Star Trek, the original series. Science fiction is always wrong. 
the best you can hope for is that the stories will remain engaging enough that you can look past all of the scientific inaccuracies. Sadly, as fans who dislike the original series prove, this is highly unlikely. And it's a shame because those of us who lived through that, we know that there's some of the stories are really very good. Laughing at them for the technology and production of values that were available in the 1960s, which are radically different from today, means you're just missing out. Another cringe moment, the synthetics being utter automatons. Uh, you know, while I don't expect these guys to look like, to be exactly like Data, they just look like robots here. It seems really stereotypical. Now the cringe moment, the Utopia Planitia being the only significant settlement on Mars. It has been long established since Star Trek, the original series, that Mars has been inhabited for a long time. And we see here its buildings and structures are actually visible from orbit. It has been heavily populated for centuries in Star Trek lore. It even has its own version of a constitution in the form of the fundamental declaration of the Martian colonies. Mars isn't a simple settlement. It is a populated planet home to at least hundreds of millions and perhaps billions even of people. Another, uh, this is one I'm really going to get into, and it branches off into a rather lengthy screed. Modern cursing. This is nothing less than lazy writing and or a poor education among the audience. Anyone can say George Carlin's Seven Deadly Words You Can't Say on Television. See, in the early 1970s, legendary com comedian George Carlin compiled a list of words that you can't say on TV, and most of them still apply today in broadcast and cable TV. And what he said these words were was, shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. Those are the deadly seven. Those are the ones that will warp your mind, twist your soul, and keep America from winning the war. Shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. Anyone can swear with the deadly seven. As is clear from what we see on the street, the use of those words is now ubiquitous and a part of everyday speech. We even see our politi politicians using them. The fact that these are the abject only uh, adjectives, adverbs, nouns, and verbs, with some of them being all four simultaneously, is indicative of the, de of the decline in American education. One, only, one of my significant worries is about education. I've kind of been in and around it most of my life, and most recently I worked for several years as an IT uh, instructor at a technical college, the place that I always call in this show, the place that shall not be named. And it was there that I learned a terrible truth. Today's high school graduates can neither read nor write nor perform the most basic math. Indeed, there have been three poorly educated generations of Americans, and this includes my generation. The current generation is receiving no education whatsoever. When I say that they cannot read nor write nor perform the most basic math, I'm not being euphemistic, I'm being utterly serious. If you graduated high school within the last 10 years, it is a near certainty that you are illiterate. Now I have an entire series on this, America's Broken Schools, and there are links to it in my description box below. And in those videos, I go into painful detail about how modern education in the United States has been abandoned in favor of 12 years of compulsory indoctrination. Teaching students useful skills to survive in life has been replaced with nothing less than communist and socialist indoctrination. It is no accident that we see the rise of communism and socialism among the last two generations of Americans. They were never taught any meaningful history, as that would include the obvious fact that at least 150 million people were killed by communism and socialism in the 20th century alone. The number of people killed by communism is 25 times the number of Jews killed in the Holocaust. Hitler, he only managed to kill 6 million of them. And this is one of the things that always scrolls past on my lower third. I often change my lower third to be more amusing or, you know, just to have variety. But one phrase that is always in every episode of my lower third is this. Communism and socialism 
always fail, killing millions in the process. Show me just one example in either the 20th or 21st century which communism worked. I'll wait. So what am I hearing? Crickets, that's what. Communism and socialism always fail, killing millions in the process. Now, for proof of this, one need only look as far as Venezuela, once one of the most richest, most popular nations, populous rather, nations and prosperous nations in the world. It has been reduced to abject poverty after only about 10 years of socialism. And if you want to see how socialism has failed in the United States, you need look no further than the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, my home state. This is modern day life on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. It has been socialist for 150 years, and this is the result. Utter squalor, crushing poverty, a place consistently named the number one slum in America. It is worse than any inner city ghetto in all the United States. And I am all too familiar with the Pine Ridge and other South Dakota Indian reservations. At one time, I had contemplated running for the United States Senate in South Dakota on the Libertarian Party ticket. Now, it is impossible for a Libertarian to win, so that my strategy would have been to lose by taking the one vote that no one gives two fracks about, the Native American vote. I, I decided that I would campaign solely on South Dakota's impoverished Indian reservations. And to that end, I actually began learning the Lakota language because it's very important to them. And I decided if I was going to do it, that I would make my headquarters in on the Pine Ridge. Now, I ended up not doing that for a number of different reasons, <laughs> my divorce being key among them. But I would certainly encourage the South Dakota Libertarian Party to do it to lose by taking the one voting block that nobody cares about. They are a thoroughly decimated people with absolutely no hope. I have participated in public forums with them and it's utterly heartbreaking. These are a people with no hope. For over 150 years, politicians have traipsed through, their, through the place giving stump speeches and never returned. Their promises that things are going to get better have never come true. I've heard social workers say that they have no answer to their patients to the just abject hopelessness. Generation after generation of Native Americans on the Pine Ridge have known nothing but horror. And there is absolutely no reason to believe that it will ever get better. The level of drug abuse and alcohol addiction would astonish you. Infants are now born, born with fetal alcohol syndrome with so much frequency that genetic brain defects are becoming increasingly concerning. This is what socialism does. It creates hardship so bad, so endemic, and so ingrained in your culture that neither you, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, on down the line until the end of time, will never grow up knowing anything other than utter squalor and crushing poverty. I mean, can you blame them that the only relief that they find is in drugs and alcohol? And by the way, don't take my word on this. The late Native American activist Russell Means often opined on how socialism had destroyed his people. Communism and socialism always fail, killing millions in the process. If you believe otherwise, it means that you were not educated, but rather indoctrinated by 12 years of compulsory education that provided you with no skills to survive in life. If you learned anything in school, it was in spite of the system and not because of it. And by the way, for dramatic effect, I'm going to let this slideshow run until the next time I have something to put up there, just so that you can continue to view what socialism creates, the number one slum in America, death crushing poverty, and a lifetime of despair and hopelessness. If you're in favor of socialism, this is what you're going to get. And if you wind up clicking away from the view review because of it, I'll have done something far more important than reviewed a TV show. I'll have opened your eyes to a reality that exists right here in the United States. And hopefully these images will haunt you forever. The fact is, 
that many of my viewers are complete illiterates, ignorant of the most basic English, math, science, history, civics, any other subject that you need in order to survive. Your lack of science education means that you haven't the skills to recognize scientific claptrap like the climate doomsday scenario. This thing is easily debunked using only the basics of the scientific method, and I've done it in a video called Climate Science is Not Science. There's a link to that below. It is, by the way, a bit shoot only video because YouTube will not allow me to upload it. Suffice to say that what passes for climate science is in no way involving the scientific method and is therefore not science, but rather a religion. Furthermore, if something like the Green New Deal were adopted, it would kill upwards of a billion people on Earth, including tens of millions of Americans. And I have a video on this, the Green New Deal, Global Famine and the Death of Billions. And there's a link to that in my description box. If the Green New Deal is ever implemented, your death by starvation becomes likely. If you don't know this, it means that you are scientifically illiterate. Similarly, the seven deadly words, the issue from your mouth if they do on a daily basis or a minute by minute basis, which is now pretty damn common, it means that you were never taught any other words. For Star Trek, in any incarnation to use casual swearing in any context means that the writers are too illiterate to come up with anything more intelligent. Its use in Star Trek to date any franchise is totally out of place and inappropriate for a utopian society in which every single member is supposed to be well-educated. It's just plain lazy writing. And for myself, you will almost never hear me swear nor curse on this show. I typically use science fictional curse words such as garam, frack, frel, and tange. And when I swear, it's rarely by God, but rather by goo. Now goo, if you don't know, it's spelled G-U-H, was a fictional deity created by the New York Futurians, which was one of the first science fiction fan clubs in existence. And they did it in the late 1920s. Now this was intended as a joke, but science fiction authors who were in the know occasionally used it in their own work as Easter eggs. But Carlin's Deadly Seven? Almost never. Anyone can use those words. It requires education and creativity to use something else. So if you're a fan jumping for joy at the use of modern curse words in Star Trek, it is a near certainty that you are an illiter illiterate ignoramai. Another cringe moment. Soji banging Narek basically on sight. I'm sorry, this is stupid. In reality, being frack buddies with someone you just met and that you know there is no possibility of knowing much about him, including his real name, is just plain stupid. In real life, women who go around banging every hot guy they happen to lay eyes on typically have very bad self-esteem issues. Now, it makes sense for Narek. He's just trying to manipulate Soji. But for Soji to do it just makes her shallow with severe self-esteem issues. Although I suppose that the men on the board cube like knowing that she's around because it means they'll always have somewhere to go for sex. I mean, after all, she will frack anyone with compatible genitalia. Starfleet abandoning the Romulans. Now here I'm going to speak and repeat basically what I said last week, because despite what Admiral Clancy said in her explanation about the Federation fracturing, it still applies. So okay, maybe synthetic life forms destroyed Mars. Okay, so maybe the fleet that they were assembling uh, stupidly in one place at the Utopia Planitia yards were destroyed. Okay, so maybe Starfleet just said, frack it. You Romulans can no die for all we care. We just can't afford the politics in saving you that it entails. Well, this is still a federation composed of a thousand planets or more. Kirk said that way back in 1967 in an episode called Metamorphosis. You don't require a federation government to get involved in a rescue mission. Two words, Cajun Navy. Now, if you don't know, the Cajun Navy is an all-volunteer group that assists in natural disasters, generally hurricanes or floods, along the Gulf Coast of the United States. It consists of anyone 
with a boat or other vehicles or tools that would be useful in a natural disaster. And while they do coordinate with government authorities to some extent, they operate totally independently. In a federation of a thousand worlds, there will be millions, perhaps tens of millions, hundreds of millions of private spacecraft owned by private individuals. This is the enlightened 24th century. Even if one, star, one of Starfleet's main facilities was destroyed and the politics said, no, don't do it, there would still be a million and millions upon millions of regular Joes who'd happily spend the next year ferrying Romulan refugees. This is another thing that is symptomatic of the growing rise of socialism and communism in the United States. Everyone has begun to expect that government must do everything. And if government can't do it, it won't get done. Well, that's nonsense. And the Cajun Navy's mere existence proves it. If the Romulan Empire were essentially destroyed, it's an absolute certainty that independent, non-governmental, free individuals would use their personally owned spacecraft to help out. Don't depend on government for everything. It is not your only option. If you think it is, look to history and even modern day to see it and change your mind. Government doesn't and can't do everything. And then there's the transporters. I talked about this last week. And it isn't exactly a cringe. It's just something that's always bothered me about Star Trek, and it seems very glaring now in Picard, particularly in this episode. Given that transporters are so ubiquitous that you can beam in and out over Boston and Starfleet headquarters, why are there other forms of transportation? Flying cars, flying anything, should be totally unnecessary with ubiquitous teleportation. Oh, flying cars makes for a nice-looking futuristic world, but with ubiquitous teleportation, they'd be pointless. For that matter, so would cities themselves. I mean, one could choose to live in a South Dakota cabin, for example, and work at Starfleet headquarters simply via transporter. And the cities should be, in fact, largely depopulated and returned to kind of small towns with few, if any, tall buildings. For that matter, even Starfleet headquarters makes little sense. Why would you centralize it someplace where, say, you know, a bunch of synths could destroy it, when you can have offices all over the world just connected by transporter? The only exception might be something like Starfleet Academy. But when you have ubiquitous teleportation, something that made crystal clear in this episode, there shouldn't be any flying vehicles at all. Now the cringe, Lieutenant Rizzo being a surgically altered Romulan. This works for Commodore O because Vulcans and Romulans are essentially indistinguishable. But it doesn't work to make someone look human. To begin with, Romulans and Vulcans have a green, copper-based blood. Their internal organs are in completely different arrangement. Their brains are even arranged differently. So how do you surgically alter all of that so that you can get Rizzo into Starfleet? It's ridiculous and indicative of either lazy writing or the writer's total lack of understanding and or research into both Republicans and Romulans. Now the cringe moment, the Borg Cube being a re reclamation project being known basically throughout the galaxy. I mean, they have Trill, they have humans, all number of other species working on it. Now, if this were one thing, if it were being done as a secret program designed to adapt Borg technology so they could go after gunning for the Federation out of sheer vengeance, but it's another for it to be totally publicly known. A Borg vessel is by definition pretty goramed and dangerous. We've seen them self-regenerate and or be put in contact with the collective repeatedly in multiple Star Trek shows. The best thing to do frankly, is to nuke it from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. So, finally, with all that out of the way, <laughs> we can get into some of the meat of the episode. Who was responsible for the good and the bad in this? I always start with the writers. And that's because if you don't have a script, you don't have anything to shoot. All the fault for anything dramatic in the show whether it's good or bad, is ultimately the writer's fault. Now, generally, when we have someone that I've not previously discussed 
One of the things that I'll do is go over their history and their awards just to establish their past work and show whether they've got anything good or not coming to it. Now, since I've not done it with these two writers on this episode, you're going to see that now. But don't worry, they are only two. I did everybody else last week in the live stream, and you can watch it on demand. And a link I've got to in my description box below. So the writers are Michael, Ch Michael Chabon and Akiva Goldsman. Now, Michael Chavon, finally going to get away from Pine Ridge. Michael Chavon in uh, media, in, in visual media, has been active 2015 to present. However, he's also an author who's written some rather amazing stuff. I have particularly enjoyed The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and C Clay, which is a somewhat fictionalized account of Superman creators Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster. And as an author, he has won in 2001 the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. In 2007, he won the Nebula Award for Best Novel. In 2008, he won the Sideways Award for Best Novel. And, uh, you know, okay, Nebula Awards are fine. Pulitzers are okay. But if you really want to impress me, you have to win Science Fiction's highest award, which would be the Hugo Award. And Shaban won the Hugo in 2008 for Best Novel. On screen, he has done Star Trek Picard. He gets a created to buy credit as well as being one of the half dozen executive producers on all 10 episodes. By the way, have you noticed that the majority of credits on Picard are producer credits? What, well, compare that to the one or two credits of all the Star Trek series from the original series all the way through Enterprise. I don't know what's going on there. But it's really weird to watch producer, executive producer, associate producer, executive, co-executive producers. Constantly, it's most of the credits. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Shaban has also done uh, three short treks. He has also done uh, the script for John Carter, which I think is a really good adaptation of Edgar Rice Burroughs' uh, A Princess of Mars. Uh, it's an underrated movie, in my opinion. He also had some scripting work on Spider-Man 2. And awards, aside from his literary awards, he won the USC Scripter Award in 2000 for Scripter Literacy, just an achievement award. He won another one in 2001 for U.S. Scripter Award for Wonder Boys. He also has five other nominations, including a Hugo Award nomination for 2008, Best Dramatic Presentation Long Form for Spider-Man 2. And then we have Akiva Goldman, and Goldsman, rather. He has been active 1994 to the present. He is another one of the gajillion elect executive producers on Picard. He exec produced all 10 short treks, exec producer on 24 episodes of Titans, the TV series. He has 29 STDs. He did The Dark Tower, Childhood's End, Paranormal Activities 2 through 4, Jonah Hex, I Am Legend, Constantine, Lost in Space, the crappy 1998 movie, I, Robot, Batman and Robin, and Batman Forever. He is set to be the screenwriter on the now-announced TV movie Ringworld. I hope that he does not frack this one up, because it is based on a incredibly deserving Hugo-winning novel by Larry Niven. Now, if you've not read Ringworld, do it right after this video, because your brain will love you for the rest of your life. In fact, I've got a link to it on Amazon. The Kindle version is only six bucks. It'll be the best six bucks that you ever spend. Now, when we come to writing, when you've got two writers like this, it's hard to attribute what to whom because you practically have to be on the set and in the revision process and know what was what. However, as it is, even with the cringe moments, still an engaging plot, I'd have to assume that Siobhan probably had the biggest hand in it. He said the most, he's the most experienced writer and, to my knowledge, has never produced a real dud. Akiva, however, has made some serious crap. If I had to say, I would say that Akiva is probably responsible for the completely gratuitous and out-of-place swearing. Now, aside from all the cringe moments, this is still an engaging story. My only real complaint is this. Just like STD, which breaks an arc into an entire season, very little actually happens in this story. I think it almost could have been told in about 15 minutes. But it's still engaging, and generally that's at least what you're shooting for. 
In terms of acting, we have, of course, Sir Patrick Stewart as Picard. What do you say? Sir Patrick is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, actors of our era. He doesn't ever do anything that's bad. Ever. Never. It never happens. And here, of course, he's playing a character that he played for many years. He has fallen back into it perfectly. We see some interactions with other characters that are really beautiful. It's Sir Patrick. <laughs> you can't go wrong with Sir Patrick. And then we have Isabel Briones as a Soji. Uh, there's still little for this character and a lot more that we're going to find out, I'm sure. Her performance is fine, especially as the station slut. I entirely believe that she's got serious self-esteem issues that would cause her to frack the first hot guy that she happens to see. Then there's Harry Treadaway as Narek, and I like his performance very much. While clearly an espionage agent, his playing the station slut apparently goes without her knowledge. It's really quite good. Alison Pill as Dr. Agnes Girati. Uh, she, there's not much to see here. She is essentially an exposition dump, but she plays that well. Jamie McShane as Japan. Now, I continue to enjoy Japan and wish that we would see a lot more of him, but sadly we're not really going to. We now know that he is at least a former Tal Shiar agent, and I really love the dynamic between he, Laris, and Picard. He plays it really well. And then we have Orla Bradley as Laris. Uh, as I say, I like the dynamic between she, Jaban, and Picard, and she plays that very well. It is interesting that she is apparently a much higher former member of the Tal Shiar. In fact, while she provides Picard with a lot of assistance, you still have to wonder if maybe she and Jaban weren't placed there to keep Picard from running off on some damn fool idealistic crusade. Be interesting to see how that works out. We have David Paymer as uh, Dr. Bayoun, ba Benyoun, rather. Um, David Payman is some is a character actor who you've probably seen about a million times, but you don't know his name. Now, I'm not going to list all of his credits and awards because, frankly, they're incredibly vol voluminous. Just look them up for yourself on uh, IMDb. As I say, a character actor you've seen a million times, but you probably don't know his name. And his uh, portrayal here as Dr. Benioun is spot on. Uh, he knows what's about to happen to Picard and is appropriately sad and even somewhat horrified about it. You have to wonder, though, that maybe that scene wasn't originally written for Dr. Crusher, except that for some reason Gates McFadden wanted nothing to do with this project. We will not be seeing her in Picard. And from what I've heard in terms of main rumors, when we hear of her, we may very well be kind of outraged. There is Tamlin Torita, uh, uh, Tomita rather, as Commodore O. That O thing, you have to wonder, uh, you know, single, it's like a single letter O, except it's spelled O-H in the credits. But, you know, it's like M in James Bond because she's Starfleet Security. And yeah, it's sort of a cute thing. I'm not going to list her credits as well. They're very long. She's a very experienced actor. She is now obviously playing a Romulan pretending to be a Vulcan. She's running this entire op. If Picard knew about her, he could no doubt expose the entire mess. But she plays a Vulcan, a Romulan pretending to be a Vulcan. She does that very well. No complaints there. Very similar. Did like the fact, by the way, that she is a Commodore. That is a rank that was used in Star Trek, the original series. It comes from real, uh, real life rank, ranks, although in the United States, the rank of Commodore for various weird political reasons, was essentially folded up into what they call Rear Admiral Lower Half. And then what was Rear Admiral became Rear Admiral Upper Half. Lower refers to the part of the promotion list that these people are on, and Upper is part of the promotion list. It was dumb. I wish they'd kept it. It's still a rank in things like the uh, uh, Navy in Great Britain, and Air Commodore is a rank in their Air Force. So... I like the fact that we had a Commodore again. We'd previously not seen a Commodore in next-gen era Star Trek, so I like that. But in terms of, uh, in terms of that, uh, you know, it's, I'm interested to see what happens next. She, she's not got a lot to do here. Um, some info dump and some telling us clearly that she has got to be a Romulan agent. Then we have Peyton List as Lieutenant uh, Narissa Rizzo. Okay, aside from the impossibility of passing a, a Romulan off as a human, 
Uh, she's very good. She's not really got much to do here, um, aside from being kind of a complete bitch. But she does it well, and we're going to see a lot more of her as things go on. So out of the acting, we get into some of the mechanics of making the film. We have the director, uh, Hanel M. M. Culpepper, and she is set for three episodes of Picard. She was the director last week. I talked about her a lot last week. Go look at my you know, review, the live stream. Her direction is quite good, as it was with the first uh, uh, episode, and in fact, I think it's quite often compelling. Uh, it be very interesting to see how she does in the future. Every shot is very carefully planned to underscore the emotion of a scene, where simply pointing a camera would just be boring. She takes extremely good advantage of modern technology that was not available for Star Trek The Next Generation to provide a lot of camera fluidity. And she captures emotions and close-ups that are worthy of an actor like Sir Patrick. Not every actor can really portray an emotion when you're this close to their face. And Sir Patrick can. Cinematographer was Philip Layton. He is set for six episodes of Picard. Was the cinematographer last week, and I talked about him then, so I'm not going to go into his bona fides now. As always, one hopes for a collaboration between the director and cinematographer. I have said this before, I'll say it again. The director's job is to say, hey, I want to get these shots. The cinematographer's job is to say, okay, I can get you those shots. But sometimes if the cinematographer and the director are working well together, maybe the cinematographer will say, hey, you know, if we do this shot just a little bit differently, it'll come out maybe a little more interesting, a little more dramatic. And they'll confab for a while and they'll decide, yeah, that would be a way to do it. I always point to the uh, collaboration between the director and cinematographer on Superman, the 1978 movie. Clearly a very good collaboration. Now, I have no idea if that's going on here, but even if it's not, it still works well. Lanyon is clearly getting all the shots that Culpepper wants and arranging lighting in such a way that it underscores the action really, really well. So I very much like the cinematography. Uh, so the production designer is Todd Cherniowski. He is doing all 10 episodes of Picard. Talked about him last week, so I won't be talking about his bona fides today. Again, we have the same kind of location shooting, this time at the Anaheim Convention Center, seen behind me for Starfleet Command. I love location shooting, I really do. I, I, it's effective here too. Starfleet Command isn't exactly what we've seen before because we've generally seen a lot of matte paintings. But it works really well here. This building being Starfleet Command works very well. Uh, he also continues to use the Sunstone Vineyards and Winery in Northern California for Chateau Picard. And he continues to work well. If you look at the pictures for that, and I, last week I had a link to it, you can see it. He continues to use the interior of that villa as well, with very few alterations, and again, it works really well. So his other, his other sets as well, the ones that are sets, are perfectly appropriate. No doubt some of them have special effects and green screen put in, uh, but aside from things like flying cars and exteriors of you know, Boston, it's hard to tell where a green screen might have been used, probably in windows. You just never know about these things. Music is by Jeff Russo. I talked about him last week as well. Won't talk about his bona fides today. He has uh, set for doing all 10 episodes of Picard. The music here is kind of starting to grow on me. Now, as any good Stoundbrack should, it adds tension and other emotions where silence would be otherwise boring. But I'm going to have to listen to the soundtrack CD when it comes available. And I can need to find and listen to some of his prior work. Now, I'm unclear that he has hit maestro status for me, but he might well be approaching it. This is really kind of growing on me. I like the music. Visual effects are attributed, as always, to an army. <laughs> and as always, we have no idea whom to credit for any particular effect, nor when effects are necessarily used. If there's any green screen work and it's completely seamless, uh, if it's there, I have no idea where. And the space effects, and particularly the Borg cube and flying through it and around it. And, you know, that was a really neat set of shots. Really, really good. I very much enjoyed the special effects throughout. Very good. Costume designer is, again, Christine Clark. She is set for all ten episodes of Picard. Talked about her last week. Not going to talk her bona fides. Again, her costumes are great. Now, I've said it before. I'll say it again. A costume is always intended to say something about the character. 
you know, people make choices about what kind of clothes they're going to wear all the time, right? So if you caught me on the street, I wouldn't have this hat. I would just have t-shirt and jeans. I might be wearing in the house or something. I might be wearing t-shirt and jean shorts, which in fact is what I have on under this. Those are my choices. For this show, I am choosing a costume. I am choosing the white shirt, the western vest, the bolo tie, uh, the hat, and uh, the uh, little pin here that I got from Mindless Entertainment a while back, Jesse Milestone. These are all intended to, tr to show something. They're intended to reinforce my brand, which is kind of a folksy guy who is doing reviews from a place that they don't usually do them, and, and trying to be as intelligent about it so that I can tell you, hey, where I live, we're not stupid. So everything here with the costumes, they fit the character while simultaneously telling you something about them. And I really like the Starfleet uniforms. I really do. Um, you know, the, the ones from Voyager, which these very much resemble, were the costumes that were actually the most utilitarian. You, know, you go back to the original series, and eh, the costumes for the men were reasonably utilitarian, but the ones for the women? <laughs> Not going to be crawling around too many Jeffrey's tubes in those micro skirts. Uh, when you get to Star, Star Trek The Next Generation, a bit more utilitarian, but still a little bit where you might have to take something off in order to do some work inside of small enclosed spaces and stuff like that. And in fact, they had a jumpsuit uniform that was sometimes used by Geordi when he had to go into one of those uh, Jeffrey's tubes. So I like these... these uh, Uniforms, they are to me the most utilitarian, and I think they look good on anybody because um, here's, an, here's an interesting deal. Um, if you're not quite as felt as uh, a lot of people in Star Trek are, wearing black will help to hide that fact. <laughs> Make that department head is James McKinnon. He's set to do all 10 episodes of Picard. I talked about him last week, uh, so I'm not going to talk his bona fides. The makeup continues to be good. Mentioned last week, mentioned it again. The Romulan foreheads. You see, in Star Trek, the original series, it was a key plot point that Romulans looked exactly like Vulcans. They looked exactly the same. That was a key plot point in the original series. Then in Next Generation, I think because they had done forehead appliances for the Klingons, they said, hey, let's do 400 appliances for the Romulans. And all of a sudden it was weird because now we couldn't have a Romulan that would pass for a Vulcan. So here now we have, and this continues to reinforce, as it has in the, in, since about 2009, that we have two different kinds of Romulans. We have the Romulans with a smooth forehead, and we have Romulans that have a forehead appliance. The forehead appliances they used here were a little over the top when you got to um, being in the Borg cube, just a little. Um, you know, the fact is that the ones in Next Gen were just gigantically huge because that's what they had to do for uh, makeup at that time, but there's no reason you can't make them considerably smaller. But they were okay. They were okay. Didn't mind any of that. Um, so the fact that the Vulcans are two different kinds, we can see that there are two different kinds, great. That means in original series we were seeing one kind, and that's why they had to look like Vulcans. In Next Gen and on, not so much. In terms of other makeup for humans and some of the other aliens, the main thing you have to remember is that these have to be really, really good makeup because they have to be good in 1080p. If you're not doing something with an appliance that will work in 1080p and it's going to show, that's bad. If you're putting regular makeup on normal human characters, and sometimes it happens, I have seen it where maybe you have an actor who has some skin imperfections, particularly women, has some skin in, skin imperfections they will put just cake makeup on. Uh, that's not happening here. Either they're hiring people that don't need to have makeup caked on or they're doing it so well that it still looks good in 1080p. So makeup is good. It continues to be good. So at the end of any review, we would ask ourselves, is it any good? In general, this is a good episode marred by some very glaring cringe moments. While I can still recommend it, I cannot recommend it quite as glowingly as I did last week's episode. It is my deep fear at this point that this is about to devolve into Star Trek Discovery Level tripe. I certainly hope not. And unfortunately, given some of the people involved, 
uh, some of the higher up executive producers, whatever all those other executive producers are doing. I have to say that I'm not quite as optimistic as I was last week. I am starting to sort of fear for the worst. I don't know. Hopefully it won't go down that path and, um, you know, it'll be good. But having what amounts to a woman who will frack the first hot-looking guy she sees without even knowing his name is not a good sign. We'll see how it goes. And that is all that I have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So thanks for watching. That is all the time that we have today for this episode of The Highly Acclaimed, World-Renowned Tales from SYO Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.